Your support helps us bring you programs you love. Go to wyomingpbs.org, click on support, and become a sustaining member or an annual member. It's easy and secure. Thank you. As far as furniture goes, Thomas Molesworth was the king of Western furniture. He was a genius. His designs were awesome. He captured something about Wyoming. He was the juice behind the movement. He was the energy behind rustic Western furniture. And he did it for Cody. He was an artist among us. And of course, his art lives on. Driving down the road out west and the wheels are singing a song About how Wyoming's just a little old town with streets extremely long Down the road, another main street, never the same street Last chance road, back gate closed, wheels won't turn Well, you got your feet down another main street of Yellowstone and the charisma of Buffalo Bill Cody drew the first tourists to Wyoming. And when the crowds arrived, they made themselves at home inside rustic lodges and dude ranches. The most remarkable outposts were Buffalo Bill's Pahashka Teepee and the man-made wonders of Yellowstone National Park. When you walk into Old Faithful, it is as grand as grand can be. It's big, tall ceilings, um, lots of burl and huge walk-in fireplaces. And um, I think for the traveler, it was spectacular to come across that land um, and come into that big, grand place that kind of matched the landscape in a way. From the turn of the century on, the rugged outdoor west was rapidly settled by a wave of visitors and transplants. But the newly constructed interior west, the spaces created within the state's growing number of lodges and ranches, had yet to be fully explored. Pioneering these roomscapes would require a blend of cowboy moxie and art school sophistication, and Thomas Molesworth arrived in Cody with both. Molesworth would become the Buffalo Bill of Furniture, a visionary who brought the Wild West inside. He devised, he came up with an entire look. He put all this stuff together to come up with the Molesworth look, which no one ever has done before or since. He's kind of the grandfather. So my take on it is uh, he did a good job, <laughs> and, it's, and it's lasted. Thomas Canada Molesworth was born in Kansas in 1890, the son of a preacher who resettled his family on a modest spread near Billings, Montana. From an early age, Molesworth let the rugged surroundings fuel his creativity. He had an appreciation and a, t a skill for art, a talent for art. So he was basically an artist. Molesworth was a ranch kid with a weakness for Charlie Russell paintings. And in 1908, he dusted himself off and enrolled in art school. He had immersed himself in the Chicago Institute of Arts uh, and for those that don't know, Chicago Institute of Arts at the time was probably the leader in the nation in uh, decorative arts. So it really was that incubator for taste and refinement, but it was also opportunity for him to learn to, to draw and paint and do other things as well. So it was, I suppose, a golden opportunity. Molesworth thrived in Chicago, but his time at the Art Institute was cut short. His father suffered some financial re reverses, uh, you know, and I think that what brought him back to Montana. So Molesworth was, his father told him to come home um, from school, that he wouldn't be another Charlie Russell. 
Molesworth took a job at Rowe Furniture in Billings. There he examined the construction of all kinds of interior fixtures, from the store-bought to the early rustic. Most of the local log builders would build the cabins in the summer, and then they would close the cabin up, get the roof finished, and then in the winter they would build the furniture. And I think a lot of the furniture that was done out here in the West was just pieces of pine just uh, nailed together that was uh, usable but not comfortable, and it didn't look great. And I think he just saw a need for something that was really beautiful, really comfortable. And then in 1930, we moved to Cody, and he started Shoshone Furniture Company. And of course, nobody had any money in the 30s to buy furniture, so he started the craft of making ranch-type furniture. I think it was an opportunity for, for him to not work for someone else, and that was important to him. There were artists here. It was a logical place to begin a furniture business, and it was a logical place to become incredibly creative. There were a number of wealthy ranchers from the East who spent their summers in Cody, and I think that Molesworth knew that there was a demand both for furniture in general, and of course he quickly realized there was demand for his rustic furniture. Molesworth wanted to build his own brand of rustic furniture in the arts and crafts tradition, a style that nurtured the creation of sturdy, simple, and original designs. I think for any aspiring furniture builder, any aspiring artist, that the arts and crafts movement became a model for what they ought to do at some point. Molesworth valued the arts and crafts style for its emphasis on craftsmanship and carefully studied the work of master furniture builder Gustav Stickley. One of the things that Molesworth was influenced by some of these early designers like Stickley at the Chicago Institute of Art was you'll notice this very thick, heavy top. Sometimes Stickley covered these with leather, with tacks. Molesworth did the same thing. The clean lines and solid construction of these classic stickly chairs clearly inspired Molesworth, who added his own Western flourishes. He used images and raw materials that evoked the spirit of the frontier, and this appealed to customers, including a wealthy publishing tycoon from Philadelphia. Moses Annenberg, who had come West uh, looking for a Western retreat. And on this same trip, or shortly thereafter, uh, Annenberg was in Cody, Wyoming. Uh, and he saw a couple pieces of rustic furniture in the window of Tom Molesworth Furniture Store and walked in and placed a huge order. The Annenberg Ranch, I don't know the square footage, but would have been on a similar, you know, not as big as Old Faithful, but that kind of scale, that kind of wanting to impress in a grand style. and. Um, Molesworth stepped up and did everything in that lodge. The Annenberg Commission launched Molesworth's career. It allowed him to expand into a much larger workshop. But then, just as business at Shoshone Furniture Company was heating up, Molesworth's factory burned down. Well, this thing was an inferno. I mean, they, they didn't save anything. He was heartbroken. But he said, I'm going to stay right here and I'm going to build it back up. In a very short period of time, he got up and running, and after that, uh, was commission after commission. The Plains Hotel in Cheyenne and other hotels around Wyoming hired Molesworth and his elite crew of artists. At this point, he had brought Ed Grigware out from Chicago. And Ed was a already pretty established artist, and what he did for Molesworth was take the furniture to the next level. Grigware produced iconic poster art for government projects, and in Molesworth's shop, he applied his skills as a silhouette artist. Man, oh man, when they got together and looked at an empty room, their eyeballs lit up. They'd say, hmm, mm hmm, here's what we can do here. Molesworth combined brightly colored leather with Chamayo weavings, Navajo rugs, and knobby pine burls, like those used in the Old Faithful Inn. Those burls generally grow above, above 9,000 feet high on very steep slopes. And uh, they're very hard to bring them out of the mountains. I've even heard people bringing them out of the mountains on pack horses. From horseback to the workshop, it was the Molesworth Way, 
and those burls would allow Shoshone furniture to create the club chair. Everybody should have like a, uh, a Molesworth club chair in red. You know, it's just the, the classic piece of furniture. It was brilliant to use a burl for the base of a club chair. I find it not to be terribly rustic, but terribly charming, which is interesting because again, it's pine, it's leather, it's burl, it's chamayo woven fabric, but all together it becomes a very cosmopolitan piece. And in the old days, they had nothing but just solid hard wood to sit on. I mean, you could relax around the fire for hours in a chair like this. This is the lazy boy of the West. <laughs> Comfortable club chairs and couches anchored a typical Molesworth room. Around these centerpieces, Molesworth created roomscapes, the same way John Huston made classic westerns. There were wild animals, six shooters, and Ed Grigware's bow-legged cowboy in a starring role. He dealt with it from the ceiling to the floor. There is a style about it. There is a craft about it that really speaks of a higher level. It was, you know, pretty amazing what he was able to do with the simple design, embellish it, and yet make it in a factory setting. And no one had ever done that with rustic furniture. I think he just had an enormous imagination, and with the West, there's lots to play with. One thing he really liked was not having a budget, and that's probably when he did his best work, uh, when he was just turned loose financially. The clients handing Molesworth blank checks were often in Cody to hunt. Atlanta Coca-Cola magnate Bob Woodruff and Boston Red Sox owner Tom Yawkey paid to saddle up with Max Wild, Cody's best-known hunting guide and Molesworth's good friend. Max had a ranch up at the head of the South Fork, and uh, my dad furnished that ranch. And a lot of uh, a lot of Max's uh, hunters were customers of of my dad. They were all John Wayne kind of guys back in those days, and these Easterners wanted to hang around with them, and they were hoping some of that would rub off. One thing that he did was network at a time where not a lot of that was done. He hung with a, you know, with a Western crowd. He was a, a tough guy and he played, uh, he played cards and drank with the best of them. Tom, cowboy hat, boots, uh, fun, you know, glasses. Uh, he loved it. He and my dad uh, had a great affection for each other. They, you know, have a little shot of whiskey and uh, then they'd tell stories and play gin rummy and throw their hats in the fireplace if they lost. Molesworth was fun-loving around the card table but rigid and meticulous in the workshop. At Shoshone Furniture Company there were no details skimped or corners cut. Molesworth had little patience for anything less. He was very very particular. I'm sure that he was not easy to please but he knew what he wanted and he got what he wanted. What he didn't want were interruptions at the shop. He was probably busy designing furniture or doing whatever he did, but I think he, he was kind of abrupt and I don't think he wanted to waste his time. He was sitting in Cody in his office and he got a call from somebody in Jackson and uh, he said, oh, I won't take that call and no, tell him to, I won't talk to them. And, and uh, they kept coming back saying, no, we need to talk to Mr. Molesworth. And he says, he yells back into his office and he says, I won't talk to anyone in Jackson Hole, even if it's John D. Rockefeller. And it turned out to be John D. Rockefeller on the phone. Molesworth did the Rockefeller Commission and others in Jackson, including the Wart Hotel. Molesworth's interior design and Ed Grigware's mural became such a hit at the wart that the owners of the rival Million Dollar Cowboy Bar hired their own artists to mimic Molesworth's style. It wasn't the first time, or the last, that success attracted copycats. Several of the people that he hired ended up being big competition. And they left Molesworth and uh, went into competition making his style of furniture. This led to a falling out with Paul and Don Hindman, 
who broke away and founded Wyoming Furniture Company. Then, when a commission came up for the Noble Hotel in Lander, the Hindmans underbid their old boss. Tom Olsworth probably never forgave them for doing that. For some, the best revenge is living well. For Wyoming furniture makers, it's the undeniable ability to create a better product. You can see the progression of his talent and refinement of his work. Into the 1940s and 50s, Shoshone Furniture continued its successful run as the Molesworth look proved irresistible to customers searching for ways to accentuate their Wild West fantasies. I think most people, when they thought of visiting the West, thought about, hey, let's go out, out West and have some fun. And so he wanted to make his furniture fun. I think that his work is probably best expressed as whimsy. Molesworth played to that kid in you, I think, were the kids that grew up playing cowboys and Indians. There were people who were um, spending their summer or a weekend at their ranch. They were riding horses, they were playing cowboy, and what a perfect way to end the evening, uh, sitting back in a chair with antlers around your ears. That sense of humor, I think, has to always apply to Western furniture. How can you build a horn chair and not smile at some point during its construction? For 30 years, Molesworth translated the visual language of the West into furniture. He became a heavyweight of Western interior design, building furniture for President Eisenhower and collaborating with famed architect Frank Lloyd Wright on a house in Cody. He at one time said that he had furniture in every state in the Union except two, and on a couple of yachts and some islands. Molesworth figured out a way to bring that outside environment inside with rustic furniture. In some ways, he's really put Wyoming on the map. Thanks to Molesworth, Cody became the hub of Western furniture. He was fully community involved, always involved, you know, making Cody a better place to live, talking up Cody. Molesworth, you know, he added to the mystique of it. That mystique lived on even after Molesworth closed Shoshone Furniture in 1960 and retired to Arizona. In Scottsdale, Molesworth entertained friends from Cody, including former Governor Millward Simpson. Those two old coots, two of them have a couple of martinis out of a thermos. Everybody thought they were drinking 7-Up and they'd eat their ham buns, laugh, have fun. Molesworth's love for Western art lived on in Arizona, where he continued to practice the art of the deal. My mother would say she'd just get used to, used to one painting and he would have sold it <laughs> so she'd have something else in the house. Molesworth kept horse trading well into his 80s. Then, in 1977, he started confiding to friends about the trouble in his gut. Eventually, Molesworth's health problems became unbearable. Tom Molesworth took his own life uh, because he had stomach cancer. And that was not unusual at that time to take cold 45 medicine. You know, he, he wasn't the first guy in the West that put himself out of misery. Uh, you know, I think there was an old saying that, you know, do for yourself what you do for your horse. News of Molesworth's death rippled through Cody as friends raised a glass to old Moley. The legendary furniture maker was gone, and beyond the social clubs and hunting lodges of Cody, the allure of Molesworth furniture was fading away. And so a lot of that stuff fell out of favor, and I'm sure a lot of it was hauled to the dump or chopped up for firewood, who knows. Because Shoshone Furniture Company was so prolific, lots of Molesworth furniture survived into the 1980s. Meanwhile, craftsmen like Paul Hindman carried on the tradition Molesworth started, even as demand for Cody furniture dipped. The Molesworth look continued its ride off into the sunset until 1989, when the Cody style was spurred back to life, thanks in part to an exhibition at the Buffalo Bill Historical Center. It wasn't until this exhibition hit the floor um, that the whole story of Molesworth began to unfold. They had realized that, you know, this guy's an icon. The exhibit reintroduced Molesworth to the world, 
and Jackson antique dealer Terry Winchell went in search of authentic collections to supply a new breed of Molesworth customer. I believe Western um, uh, culture is cyclical and um, people come back around and get excited about the West and at the time that uh, Terry uncovered his first Molesworth, the West was hot and um, there was dances with wolves and uh, stockbrokers were wearing their bolo ties to work and uh, fashion models wearing boots on the runway and Terry uncovered Molesworth and people were, were excited to see something Western. The timing was right. Uh, everybody was becoming interested in the West again. I think all of us 50-somethings were living out our fantasies and it just started as a whirlwind. <laughs> noon in the Molesworth Revival was 1996, when Christie's Auction House in New York City brought a vast collection of Molesworth furniture up for sale. You know you're getting ready to enter into an incredible world of fantasy. That one auction raised millions of dollars in the sale of Molesworth furniture. That really set the world on fire. After the auction, my phone started ringing and I bought some of the greatest collections within the next five years after that auction. This passion for Molesworth has taken him all over the country and um, he has discovered mole, more Molesworth than anyone. I would either get in my pickup or the larger truck we have or on an airplane depending where the furniture was at. Today, Winchell remains a one-man antiques roadshow. Well, I have something out here in the garage I'd like to show you that I just brought back. Winchell authored a book about Molesworth, and his Fighting Bear Antiques serves buyers who pay $35,000 for club chairs Molesworth sold for $300. And now today, these little drink stands sell for like $2,500 at auction. Drink stands, couches, Navajo rugs, Thunderbird carvings, and a bobcat head. It's all here at the Bear Lodge just outside Jackson. This private residence built in the style of the Old Faithful Inn is home to the largest single collection of Molesworth furniture. Within the roomscapes of this 16,000 square foot, $60 million mansion, Molesworth's status as a furniture phenomenon is firmly sealed. I think Thomas Molesworth did become a phenomenon, but I don't think he ever thought of himself in that way. I don't think uh, Thomas Molesworth took this stuff too serious. He probably is rolling over in his grave, you know, <laughs> when he sees what's, what's going on today. He had his tongue in his cheek for much of the time that he was designing and constructing furniture. I find that people sometimes uh, take Western furniture too seriously and um, I think at, at its heart, it's quite innocent and uh, quite fun and romantic. And inspirational, especially to a new generation of furniture makers who continue to shape the Cody style. I just think he was, because he was the first, because he just, he started something. Cody is a host of the Western Design Conference, where artists push the limits of rustic furniture. For John Gallus, that means adding more organic twists to a foundation laid by Molesworth. You do have to use your imagination because one person may look at this and say, oh, firewood, but I look at it as potential furniture and potential art. I think in this day and age, there, there are some craftsmen who do elegant and wonderful pieces, who work from the philosophy of saying that the word will speak to me and let me know what it is that it wants to be. You look at it and you just wonder, you know, if it could talk, how, how much it, it could, stories it could tell. Nature is just awesome. You can't top it. You can't compete with it because you're just going to lose. Having the, the proper eye, uh, and I'm still developing that, that uh, to be able to look at something. And sometimes we just put our tape measure away and, you know, if it looks right, it is right. Doing Western furniture right. It's a Wyoming tradition 
born in the imagination of Thomas Molesworth. Thomas Molesworth was the Rembrandt of Western furniture design. No one since, before or since, has ever equaled the kind of stuff that Molesworth has done. Molesworth is revered because, as a Wyoming person because he, he did start from scratch. Number one, I think that they respect, hey, you know, maybe, you know, some, there was really somebody that had an eye on design out in the middle of nowhere. It's a design that's, that will never lose its appeal. And it really is a design that speaks to Wyoming. There was something that was needed here, and he fulfilled it. He was able to um, interpret Wyoming and, and uh, make something that was truly from here. Buffalo Bill has often been said to bring the West to the world. Um, I suspect at many levels, Molesworth was able to bring a similar West to living rooms across the nation. So he would say, uh, well, maybe it was all worthwhile after all. He would be pleased with that. He'd be pleased to see that it's being carried on in Cody. There will never be another Thomas Molesworth.